<laughs> Jensen Show, thank you for coming back. Thank you for having me back. I adore you. I, I don't think it's possible though to know you and not like be obsessed. You're like the instant obsession <laughs> for everybody. <laughs> this is what's happened in the world. So last time you were here, we spoke about your first few amazing blockbuster books, but you've written yet another book, which is really the book that I need um, because it addresses some things like boundaries. Um, it's like, what's boundaries for someone who's codependent and a people pleaser? So we'll get into that. <laughs> um, but before we do, what what is it that has made you feel like continuing to write these books? Because you said so much in the first one. What's your own journey like that you right. keep excavating all this extra good stuff? You know, that's such a great question. And believe me, I ask myself that every time I write another book, I'm like, <laughs> God, do I have more to say about this? Is it, What else can I say? So You Are a Badass was obviously the first one. And then You're a Badass at Making Money. I had to write because my whole journey into self-help for you was around money. So I was like, that is a no-brainer. I've got to do that. Then You're a Badass every day. I always wanted to do something because I'm all about the quick and dirty. I really want people just to get the damn info and run with it. And I want to get the damn info and run with it. I can't stand windbags. I'm from New York. I'm impatient. <laughs> so, um, so You're a Badass every day was that sort of like just because all a lot of this stuff, we all know it, right? We just got to remember it. So You're a Badass Every Day was just that little reminder book where you could open it to any page and just remember all the stuff that you've already learned. So that was that one. And then Badass Habits. I had a course, an online course on habits years ago. And I was like, you know, I can't, I can't not write this one either because all the work that we've done in the previous books, getting that on autopilot is what it's all about. Yeah. So I was, was really excited to write the habits book, but believe me, I almost wrote the whole book on boundaries. Uh, I, I was going to be your, your badass at boundaries. And then I was talking to my editor and we're like, the habits thing. And, you know, Eureka, I can put the boundaries in the habits book, because if you don't have good boundaries, you're going to totally fall on your face on your new habit. So it worked out. Okay. Well. This is so good. I love hearing this. So we can really zero in on that. Cause that's mm -hmm. for sure an Achilles heel for me. And it makes mm -hmm. sense that your publisher would come from that place because you have to sell people what they want and give them what they need. And everybody mm -hmm. would be really excited to learn new habits, but mm -hmm. nobody thinks they have a problem with boundaries because we don't even know what it means to have boundaries. Right. So let's Let's start there and then we'll dig around the, into the rest of the book because there is okay. a lot of other good stuff in there. Why did you feel compelled to write something about boundaries and explain to us why that is such an important thing to get right? Um, I'll tell you why I personally did it. I don't think everybody has to wait until this, but when I hit 50 a couple of years ago, I it was like a gorilla had crawled off my back. There was something about that monumental birthday where finally I was just like, enough. I am, I am, I, boundaries became so easy for me. All honestly, almost all of a sudden, I mean, I think as we get older, we definitely lose the, the, the desire to not even the desire, I guess the impetus to, to come from insecurity and people pleasing it. And we, we start to sort of grow our own confidence and, you know, stick up for ourselves more. But by 50, man, I was done. I have no problem saying no when I don't want to. I have no problem saying yes. I leave other people to their own drama. I deal with my own. It just, and I was like, I've got to share this with the world because if I had this information when I was in my 20s, wow, so much time and energy would be saved. So I was, I just, I feel like I've mastered it in a, in a big way. And I really wanted to share that with the world because I'm so excited, especially the ladies. Yeah. And you know what? I could feel that in your residence that you mm. just like, crossed over to the other side of that river. Let's talk about though, for people who haven't, mm -hmm. how can we sort of know when it's like needing our attention and how can we do it when it feels so damn uncomfortable to possibly have someone be upset with us? I find the best way to discover where you need to do the most work is what, look at your complaints. Look at what you complain about the most. Who do you complain about the most? Who do you spin out the most about in your mind? Who's driving you nuts because they're too needy or you're so mad that you said you would do something for them when you didn't feel like it? Like we have all the information we need in all of the 
and all of those things. And also, where do you feel tired? Like what, if you're feeling exhausted, if you're feeling grouchy, like all the, the negative energy sucky feelings that we've got are excellent compasses as to where we probably need to up our game in the boundaries department. That's so good. And so clear, like, just look at what you're complaining about and write, look at that, write it down, put a flashlight on it. And yeah. there you go. But then how do you actually do it? Like, I know for myself, I can be crushing it at work. And then my dad mm -hmm. and stepmom come over who they're very well-meaning, nice people. But like, if I have something I need to say no about, for, mm -hmm. oh, for, I won't even pee, Jen, for like six hours. I'll just be like, oh, I forgot <laughs> I have to pee. <laughs> and I, I, I can't even sit yeah. down and like, my husband's like, did you even eat? I'm like, no, 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 no. Don't even mention that I didn't eat. Like it's right. I, lo I lose myself. I lose yeah. myself all the time. Okay. Well, so this is such excellent information to have, right? You know that those two people set you off in this certain way. So that's such good information. So set the intention before they come over to be like, I need to take some breaks. I have a body that has needs and I'm going to tend to those needs. So you, you, a lot of times, and, and this is such an excellent point you raise actually, because a lot of our boundaries are very different with different people, right? Like you can be excellent at saying no at work, but you can't say no to your dad. You, you can say yes to fun things with one friend, but for some reason you won't let yourself have fun with somebody else. Or we, we, we're, we're very habitual patterned kind of people. So you have all the information. So just really look at it and be like, okay, I know this is an issue when they come over. What can I put into place to set myself up for success next time this happens? Yeah, I love that. Sort of like rehearse it ahead of time. Mm -hmm. I think I am obsessed with intention setting these days. I, I, say, I wake up every morning when I can remember to set an intention for the day. And then it helps you get to that magical place where you pause instead of react. And I, I'm all about intentions lately. And I think for boundaries, that's epically important. So now here's where it gets a little bit tricky is there might come a moment where someone doesn't like it and they make a fuss or they mm -hmm. let you know that they are very unhappy and you have to tolerate that. Mm -hmm. And that feels like you're literally set on fire. I know. How do you yeah. do that? Cause clearly you've mastered that. I mean, mastered it ish, you know, but I also, it's all about how you frame it. Right. And it's all about where you place your focus. So your focus when, when, you know, especially with the saying no boundary and especially with women, this is such a common one where we're, we're, you know, we live in a patriarchal society that trains us to put everybody's needs in front of our own. If we even have the audacity to look at our own needs at all. Right. So, um, it's about reframing that and being like, Oh yeah, you know what? My needs matter not only because I matter, but also the more I take care of myself, the more able I am to take care of others. So when you reframe it like that, and when you understand that setting healthy boundaries is an enormous part of that, you're actually doing a favor for that person who is pitching a temper tantrum because you haven't dropped all of your needs in order to service them. And this is so important too, to get yourself into this space of understanding that it's not only okay, but it's a super important, positive thing for everybody. Because then when you set the boundary, you're not doing it in this way that's apologetic or whiny or, you know, just waiting for the pushback. You're confident in it. You say the way it is and you move the hell on. Because if you're weird about it, they're going to be weird about it. Right. I mean, we all know what it's like to meet somebody who's no nonsense about their boundaries. Like, yeah, I'm not available for that at all, but I will help you do this because I'm okay with that. You just take their word for it, but you got to take your own word for it first. And, and I really think that comes from, from understanding that you're doing everybody favor. You're, you will have more energy there, because the other thing is you spend a lot of energy in passive aggressive feelings oh my God. and resentment. Yeah when you overextend yourself, right? And and who likes being around somebody who's passive aggressive towards, you know, when someone's passive aggressive towards me, I'm like, what the hell did I do? You don't know. It's it's fun free for everybody involved. So fun free. <laughs> getting on board with the with the reality that setting boundaries benefits everybody is the first step for sure. Yes, that's so true. It's so true. In in terms of boundary setting, 
And in terms of these kinds of things, which can be sort of the more unpleasant things, like it's more fun to be like, Jen, tell us about the money thing again, which I do want to go back into because when you were here last, that book was like almost coming. Um, How does this maybe affect though, your manifesting of the life that you want? These things that are about your habits that are the not so sexy things to talk about, but the things that we were just talking about does that play a role in helping us to manifest our dream relationship or our dream money goals or anything else? The setting of boundaries or the creative habits? Yeah, all of of these habits. Absolutely. I mean, especially, well, just starting from the boundary thing, when you change who you're being, which is what a habit is doing, when you create a new habit or ditch an old habit, you're changing who you're being. And um, that in itself is extremely upsetting to the status quo and the quote unquote reality and all of your relationships, right? Even if it's just floss in your teeth, it's changing the way that you treat yourself. It's changing what you expect of yourself and how you view what's available to you, right? So you're changing a, a behavior and you're hence changing your identity along with that behavior. So um, I sort of am going off on a tangent, so I'm going to try and bring it back to what you were saying, but I basically, it's a big freaking deal changing and, um, setting new boundaries and changing habits shifts everything in your world. Um, and so it's uncomfortable and it's going to challenge your relationships. It's going to challenge your perception of yourself. It's going to challenge the actions you take. Cause now you're taking new actions that you weren't taking before. So of course that's going to change all of the manifesting that you do in your life. That's how you manifest things is by changing your thoughts, beliefs, and words in your actions. That is the formula. So yes, this is all, all totally part of that process. And the good news is when you get good at getting it on autopilot, then it makes it so much easier. It's not, you're not using so much thought process to manifest what you desire. Yes. And I'm so glad you just connected those dots for people because a lot of times people are are listening and they're saying, well, I'm saying mantras. I watched the secret and Mm -hmm. I just came back from doing a week with Joe Dispenza and, and he's basically saying what you just said, which is your mood creates a personality. That personality creates your personal reality. So a hundred percent it's this stuff. You can do all the mantras in the world and you can make a vision board But if you keep living out the same way you've done yesterday and the day before, you're going Mm -hmm. to have the same thing manifested over and over again. So in your book, when you talk about daily upgrades, Mm -hmm. what are some of those daily upgrades that you hope that people feel encouraged to make? Mm. Well, so um, the badass habits, I, I, I wrote about boundaries and I wrote about habits and just the general background. But then what I did that I was so excited to do was I put a 21 day course in the book because I'm a coach and I want results. And I don't want people just to read another book about habits and then go off to their lives and forget about it. So I was really excited to put this 21 day course in that are basically 21 daily upgrades that you can make um, while you're reading the book. So as you're learning it, you're implementing it, which I think helps you not only get results, but also remember what the hell you just read. And um, so, you know, some of the daily upgrades would be writing a mantra. I'm a huge mantra believer. Mantras have saved my ass. So I spent, so the first day you, I sit down and show you how to write the mantra for whatever habit it is that you're trying to adopt or break. Um, Oh, another daily upgrade is the chunking down process that I've actually talked about, I think, in most of my books, because I would have zero books written if I didn't practice chunking it down to where it's just sort of focused. Like, let's say your habit is that you're going to write for an hour a day. You know, that's it. You want to write a book. Chunking down your time into like 10, 15, 20 minute intervals so that you are focused on nothing but writing that book will get you so much farther than if you say, I'm going to write for an hour. You know, what is that exactly. thing they say? If you have an eight hour a day job where you go to work for eight hours, you actually work for three and you spend the rest of the time dicking around doing whatever. Yeah. yeah. So that, that, that honing of your focus is another trick that we have in there. Um, yeah. There's a lot. I love that you just said, because I'm a coach, because obviously you're a coach, but the reason I love it is because and you know this because you coach and because of the books that you've written, 
so profound. All the prolific is really not even, it's an understatement for you, but the biggest thing that comes up for people is imposter syndrome. And so I want you to actually highlight this because people would look at you and be like, well, of course she's a coach. I mean, she's a genius. She's made multi millions of dollars, but in your books, you're very vulnerable and naked about like, I was living in a garage. I was 40. I was eating cans of tuna fish. And our listeners are like, who am I to say that I'm anything? Mm. Who am I to help somebody else? Meanwhile, they're looking at you. You're literally living proof of this, but they're not able to necessarily cross that river for themselves. How can you help people with that? Uh, by telling them that I had, I think, three books out before I could actually say out loud without throwing up in my mouth that I am a writer. I had such a fraud complex around that. You? You're literally yeah. the best writer. You are the, it's the funnest Thank thing in you. the world to read your book. It's like Thank watching you, a movie. And- <laughs> best. But it's true. And I remember just feeling oh like God. it was beginner's luck and same with coaching. I actually was just talking about this morning about how like, I still, I think I'm an okay coach. Like I still have a little bit of the frauds around the coaching thing. It doesn't really necessarily go away is what I'm going to say. I know I'm a good writer now, but it took a long time. I just want you to know that. Um, it doesn't necessarily go. So don't wait for it to go away. It's like fear. Don't wait for fear to magically disappear. Fear is not going anywhere. Move on instead, like act as if go forth and prosper in spite of. So don't, don't wait for your fraud complex to go away. Just keep taking action. Keep educating yourself. Keep pushing yourself outside your comfort zone. And eventually it will melt away after so much proof of the fact that you kick ass. Now, this is something that you talk about all the time, but you just said it. I want to piggyback on it. You know, you said go forth and prosper. And I, I don't just highlight your books anymore. Seriously. I I highlight them. Then I go back and type out the highlights of the things I highlighted. And then I type them into my phone because they're so good. One of the things that you say is in, in one of your books, you talk about how everything in nature was designed to flourish to its greatest potential. When I read that, I was like, that hit me like a ton of bricks. That's so beautiful. Like every tree, you don't see a redwood being like, oh, I'm too tall. Right. But when you just said, go forth and prosper, the more I read your books, there is such a resistance to prospering. I know. And you talk about this. So I think it's yeah. important to talk about it again. What mm-hmm. the hell is that? Because people are like, there's no, I don't have resistance to having more and, and right. feeling joy. It's like, yes, you do. Can we, can we unpack that? Sure. Are we talking about the ladies or everybody? Well, we're 90% of female All audience. Right. So, well, because <laughs> I want to start with that. The patriarchy, man. I mean, it is real. It is real. Women are raised, women raised in a patriarchy are second class citizens. We are the weaker sex. We don't get paid as much. We are misogynist. Like I have found myself in the past hiring a dude instead of a woman just because I subconsciously think he's going to do a better job. And then I'm like, what are you doing? It's so, so, so deeply ingrained on us, in us. Um, And that is, I'm going to say, the main reason why we doubt ourselves and have the fraud complexes and have all this stuff. And we are aware of it. So now we have the opportunity. And I, I, I am so grateful that I am a woman at this point in history. I think it is so exciting. It is. Everything's changing. We have money, we have power, we have voice, you know, it, it's great. We still have room to grow, but, um, but I think it really is questioning as with anything, right? Any negative belief, you first become aware that you have this negative belief instead of just knee jerkily buying into it as the way it is or the truth or being completely oblivious, right? So first you wake up to the negative belief and then you question it. It's so simple. And then you just keep questioning it and bringing it back and being like, is it true that I have no right to, to, to make a ton of money? Why? Oh, because um, only greedy, egomaniacal fatheads make lots of money. Am I a greedy, egomaniacal fathead? No, I want to do good with my money. So then you just keep questioning it and bringing it back. And I'd say nine and a half times out of 10, you're looking at something that is actually really beautiful. Yeah. And it, it is something that I I can't even imagine how many times you've been asked these questions about people, helping people to get out of their own way with this stuff. But 
You Are a Badass at Making Money is a book that should be required reading. It should be required reading because we, we need to raise our capacity to feel better and have more resources so that we can do more good. And I love when you're like, it'd be really cool if there were more women with big checkbooks, right? Like, isn't that a good thing? We could be a custodian of this. And what you just said is what I notice is that my audience is very good natured and they really want to hold on to the value of I'm a good person. Oh man. And they really feel like Right. They have to choose. And you write about this so well, but could you just talk about how that is definitely not the case? Oh my God. I could talk about this for 500 hours. I know. <laughs> it makes me crazy. I know it's not mutually exclusive being a good person and being somebody who's acquiring lots of wealth. It is not mutually. It's, it's so interesting to me how if you walk in a room of friends and be like, you know what, this year I'm going to get so rich. I'm going to get rich, rich, rich immediately our minds go to, you are going to compromise your morals and do horrible things. Well, that's even when you just said it, you're like, oh, who would say that? What right? a gross person. And that's such a gross. weird response, but that's a good yep. thing. Yeah. Yep. Meanwhile, think of all the amazing things money have done has done for you just today. Like it's turned on my electricity. I bought some coffee. I, you know, sent money to some charities. I, you know, bought a sweater or whatever it's brought. Money is a tool. Money is just a tool. Any weirdness that is on it is stuff we put on it. It's a choice, right? To make it good or evil like anything else. So, so it really is about um, deconstructing again, all of the negative beliefs that you have around money and questioning them. Right? Why is me walking into a room saying, I'm going to get so rich this year? Why is that bad? If that brings up something gross in you, question it. It is all about the questioning. And one thing that goes right in with this, which you talk about, and it also goes in with what you said before about women, is we really feel that we need to dim our light because it's going to shine in somebody else's eyes. Mm. It's just so, it's almost gross how. There's so much apologizing. I know. And just so much of this, like where we we're just not stepping into our power. Yeah. Yeah. I it, it, again, it really is, it's not ladylike. It's um, you know, when you step into your power, also you become visible. You know, when you when you have the audacity to be big and bold and beautiful and out for all to see, you can get shot down. And they do it in this society all of the time. Women are completely criminalized for being big, bold, and glorious. So we are on the front, you know, frontier of deconstructing that. And it's a very exciting place to be. And it's a very terrifying place to be. But think of the paths that we're all, even in our little, even just in in our own small worlds, like, you know, I have a friend whose grandmother just endlessly inspired her. Just, she, you know, she'd skinny dip in the, in the, in the bay that they lived on in Maine, every, you know, freezing cold water at 83, she was ripping off her clothes. Like just, you know, anybody who is just who they are, unapologetic, especially women, you give a leg up to the next generation. So any any way that you can do that, not only is gonna inspire somebody else, but then you get to live your life, your one and only chance to be the you that is you on planet earth, being yourself and enjoying your life. That's big stuff. It's really big stuff. And one of the main things that comes up for my audience is a feeling of, I would do it, but then like you just said, I'll be visible and I'll be messy and I'll make something mediocre or I'll, Mm -hmm. I won't get the podcast right the first time, or I won't write the book the best way. What the heck are we going to do about that? Okay. So a couple of things, first of all, um, take a moment to feel into that fear at, that is also the same feeling almost as the excitement, right? That fear and excitement of doing something that you're totally terrified, but so excited to do. It's almost that the same vibration, right? And then think about the feeling and then feel into if you don't even try that dead, flat, wet blanket of not even trying. 
that vibration of the energy of the terror and the excitement is where you want to keep your focus. Okay. So you focus on that. And then the other thing that I recently have just remembered that I wrote about in you are a badass is the whole idea of, I just want to see what I can get away with. Like take the drama out of it. Just like, I just want to see if I can have a successful podcast. I just want to see if I can become a movie star at 55. I just want to see if I can double my rates and, and, and grow my, and double my business this year. I just want to see what I can get away with. I'm just going to try it and make it an adventure instead of some, some heavy thing that determines whether or not you're a good person, you know, or whatever you've got hanging on it. I know this drama, oh, like, the as drama, opposed guys. to just like, let it just be this curious thing. Why does it yeah. have to be yeah. so heavy? I find a lot of comfort in a way in the fact that we're on a ball in infinite space, because that gives me permission to be like, okay, that is bonkers. I'm on a ball in infinite space. You and I right now are on a ball in infinite space. So if that's true, why couldn't I A, B, C, or D? Because that's impossible right there. Part of it that I notice is the, I can't see that possible path. And mm -hmm. I think the reason I love doing this show in the simplest, simplest way to say it is it gives people, um, it shows people a possibility, right? I have you on, they start to listen to the way you talk. They're like, oh, I never heard words put together that way. I never even mm -hmm. thought I could conceive of a world that way. And in your books, you talk a lot about this scarcity mindset and mm -hmm. boy, people are just riddled with that. Like that is none of the things you just said are possible. Like 55, I'm going to go be an actor or I'm going to double my rates. There's not even customers out there. And Jen, didn't you know there's a pandemic? I can't make any money. I can't do anything. No one's listening. Everyone's miserable. Whoa. That is just so stifling and heavy. How do we overcome that sort of, that is a bad habit, mm -hmm. right? How do we overcome that bad habit of just mm -hmm. like believing those thoughts right. that we can actually start to reset that? Right. Um, going to the spiritual gym every single day, reading, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, reading self-help books every single day. It's a muscle guys, this positivity. You still this... do that? You still do oh, that? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, I'm a sprint runner, so I go through phases I'm yeah. just coming out of about a year long phase. Well, it's so funny. I keep forgetting. I wrote a book during this year long phase of doing yes, nothing that I keep talking yes. about. But... <laughs> a whole book. Just birthed another child, but yeah. I did nothing. On either end of that, however, I was, I am now an expert in ice cream flavors and robes. And I mean, I really, I did nothing, which I, which I loved. And I just let myself be a sloth and there was nothing to do anyway. Um, so no, I wasn't, I wasn't reading the self-help books. I just went down, but I also strengthened my spiritual practice, just being quiet and not being distracted. So it was a really beautiful time, but I'm back in the game now and I am reading a self-help book every single day. Um, I'm listening to guided meditations. I'm listening to inspiring podcasts. You know, music is huge for me. I'm listening to inspiring music. Um, and, you know, so that, you know, whatever your spiritual gym practice is, exercise, nature, yada, yada. Also, who are you hanging out with? That is epically important. Oh. Who are you surrounding yourself with? Completely shifts. You remember, it's all about remembering guys it, to remember, to focus in one direction or the other, depending on who yeah. you hang out with. If you hang out with a bunch of sad sacks, that's where your focus is going to be. If you hang out with people who are kicking butt and going to the spiritual gym, that's where your focus is going to be, you know? And then the third thing I just want to mention, because this is something that I started doing just organically and, and man has it made a difference in my life is I wake up every morning and remember to set an intention for the day and I love this intention setting stuff because it helps me strengthen that muscle of taking a pause where I remember I'm like oh yeah my intention today is not to complain I, I'm really trying to get better at that so so I've set that intention and when I start complaining or I start spinning out about anything I pause and, and I'm making myself do this thing where anytime, and I put this in the badass habits book too, where you can use your negative triggers, your negative actions as positive triggers. So anytime I find myself complaining about something or someone or, or going down the deep dark hole of this is impossible, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. I catch myself and I'm like, I'm doing it right now. So I'm going to lean back and remember that I'm on a ball in infinite space and miracles are everywhere and totally possible.
Yes, yes, yes. That's so good. I want to ask you this question because I've been sitting with this and I'm not really sure how to hold it. And I, I think that my audience might be too. And you are like, literally like you, you are the connoisseur of all of the different self-help and spiritual practices, which is why you've sort of taken the best for all of us and put so much of your own spin, but then given us what you really feel works in the books. And where I think there might be a little bit of a juxtaposition sometimes there's this one thing, which is like the power of positive thinking, right? There's, mm-hmm. this is all really important. And what you just said, setting intention. And I just came back from a week, like I said, with Joe Dispenza, where there's a lot of really stepping in, stepping into that future self. At the same time, I'm taking a class right now with John Kabat-Zinn, who's brilliant. And it's about rolling out the welcome mat to what's actually there. Mm-hmm. And noticing and and being witness to, oh, I'm still carrying around a lot of pain from being eight years old and whatever. Or I'm, mm-hmm. I don't often know how to reconcile those two things. Mm. And so I went from like a year of doing these like meditations where I was like manifesting and having this like, you know, orgasm in my mind of all this. And it was awesome. And I'm still doing that a little bit. Mm. But then doing this pure sort of mindfulness work mm. of just sort of bringing an awareness and a witnessing without a pushing of the river, Mm. it's really confusing because you don't want to get pulled back into just like Mm -hmm. sitting in the bad habit of the familiar old self. And at the same time, neuroscience sort of shows that we need to do a little bit of both of this. We need to, Yeah. how do you, how the hell have you, (laughs) because you're a black belt at all of this stuff. How do you sit with those two thoughts? Yeah. Those two schools of thought. Yeah. This is so interesting because I just took a online course with um, Esther Hicks and, yes, sure. you know, and she's all about asking it is given and focusing on what you, you know, don't right. even pay any attention to. And I am a huge believer in therapy. Therapy has shifted so many things for me. So that's all about dwelling in the past. Right. And I wanted to ask her this question and then I didn't get to, but I've thought yeah. about it a lot. No, no, no. But I thought, I know, but I will, I really want to hear her take on it. But I'll give you my take for what it's worth. So um, I think it's the same thing as having a bad day or feeling angry or feeling sad, right? We don't deny our feelings and pretend everything's great because I think positive all the time and I'm on this path of, you know, changing my life. You feel like crap sometimes. You, you, you're sad, you're, you're just, you know, whatever. But it's, it's about not identifying with those feelings and not not collapsing into them, right? So you feel the pain, you have the temper tantrum and you really feel it. It's really important to feel your feelings and then you move the hell on. So this is what I think about the therapy stuff. You feel that pain, you've got to integrate it because if you push it, what you resist persists, right? So you have to integrate it. It's really important. So yes, do the therapy, do the work, notice your eight-year-old child who's so still upset and stuck in whatever and be there with it and look at it and integrate it and keep your eye on the prize. You can do both. Again, it's not mutually exclusive. It's about getting stuck there. That makes a lot of sense. And you're right. What you resist persists. Mm -hmm. So therein lies the danger of just like, oh, I'm going to put a bandaid on this. Like, yes. And that's work it through. That's the other thing that all of your books help us to do, which is essentially, it's not about hustling. It's about raising your vibration. It's about Mm -hmm. showing up in the world with a certain resonance. And then of course the phone rings and of course this person DMs you. And of course this, and that's what you did when you were in that garage is like, that's what happened is you changed your vibration. You went on a spiritual internal quest it wasn't about sending out more letters. It was about something internal that then attract. How do you explain that yeah. to people who don't still really get that? Well, I'm going to say it was about both. I hustled my ass off. So, um, and, and, and you don't always have to necessarily, okay. but, but um, because certainly things can come just through energy, right? But I do believe, you know, but, but usually I, we can't just sit around and meditate and make a vision board and sit on our couches and wait for our lives to change, right? Like we do have to get out there and do stuff. Right. Inspired action, right? Inspired action. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, but the frequency that you do it at and where you place your focus, mm-hmm. it honestly is, 
it's um, basically everything that you need to change your life that you're looking for is already here. That person that you want to meet, that client that you can't wait to get, that job, that part in the play, la la la, everything's already here. So where your energy is, you know, it determines it, it's where you place your focus, right? So if you're focusing on it and you're excited about it and you're in that energy, it's on your radar where, cause I, I do a whole thing about this in, um, in badass habits about how we create foundations of reality because we need to be right. Right. Oh yeah. So, that was right, so, so good. So if I need to be right about the fact that there's no good men out there in the world, um, I hate dating, the online dating sucks, right? So that's where I'm placing my focus and I'm, I'm building a foundation. That's my reality. And I'm, I'm looking for proof of that. I'm constantly looking for proof unconsciously. When you shift, and this is why mantras are so important, when you shift your beliefs, even if you have a lifetime of proof that you suck at dating and you've dated a trillion horrible people, when you decide to be available to the miracle in spite of your environment and you just are open to it, you got a new mantra, your energy there, your frequency's there, you're, you, you see things and you, and you are available to opportunities that you would not even notice because you were too busy proving the opposite was true. Oh my God, that's so powerful. Yeah. And you've said that in, in different ways, in different books. I remember you saying that, like, we look for evidence of what we think is true. Right. And that changed my life. Really. I started making lists in the morning of like, what am I going to look for the evidence of today? And what you Mm. just said is so powerful. What, what I did want to ask you, because you just kind of mentioned relationships for a second. Mm -hmm. I find this Jen is that like, myself, my friends, my colleagues, I just had Rachel Hollis on. We just had a good talk about her new situation. She just got divorced. I just talked to her ex-husband. <laughs> yeah. And I know that he loves you. I just, I had, I had him on too about a month ago. Uh, We've stayed yeah, friends. They're both, they're both yeah, great yeah. human beings, like up for doing work, up for being mm-hmm. conscious and all that good yeah. parents. But she and I talked about how, and this is true for so many of my girlfriends, sometimes we're almost able to fully get this in our work, but not in our relationships. Mm-hmm. Like I see so many women that yes, they still need to overcome a lot and know their worth and rise up and then welcome mm-hmm. in bigger blessings. But if I ever see women able to do it, it's often much more so in their career yeah. and still they're at home feeling yeah two inches tall, abandoning themselves, not knowing how to receive. Yeah. And I think this needs to start being talked about because this yeah. is major, right. especially for women who are powerful like you. Yeah. You, yeah, you, yeah. Make, you make your own empire. You do. What do we do about this? Right. <laughs> Well, I'm going to say I'm in the same boat. Like that has, that, that is my next frontier. Like, I feel like I've done pretty much everything I've set out to do. And I was like, all right, the intimacy yes. thing, right? So, so, so now it's about that for me. And I will let you know, cause I am not going to let the belief that I was raised with that powerful women are unattractive and too masculine and intimidating and all the lovely things that we've been taught. And so I'm done. I'm, I'm, I promise you, I'm going to figure this one out and I'll, I'll let you know. I just had Priyanka, <laughs> I just had Priyanka Chopra on the show and mm. she's so filled with grace and all of this. And I said, you could literally have married any man. Cause you're absolutely stunning and brilliant. I said, why did you marry Nick Jonas? And she said, he wasn't intimidated by the fact that I was super, super mm. successful. In yeah. fact, he was like on our first date, like, we don't have to come with me. You have a meeting. Let me help you get to the meeting and then we'll go mm. later or whatever. And I'm saying that to say that there are definitely men who are not intimidated. They totally, totally are. So this is one of those places where in the morning I set the intention and anytime I get down about that subject, I'm like, I'm on a planet in infinite space. Miracles exist. Yes. I don't give a crap. Right? But my question is, when you say that I'm open to miracles, we can only be open to that which we feel worthy of receiving. Mm. And I notice for myself that like, you know, I had a goal to make millions of dollars or whatever. And it was just like, great. It's fantastic. Somehow in my marriage, 
I can't even see that possibility. And I married a nice guy, but I don't mm-hmm. feel like I'm living that thriving life that I want to live with him. And I talked to so many of my other friends who we've built these careers, we've had these kids and I'm like, huh, how come I can't see that? And I've never been able to. Now I also have parents, like a lot of people who had parents in the eighties who in the seventies and sixties who fought and my mom had no sense of self Mm. and um, definitely modeled for me, like a feeling of, it was always her fault or she always felt guilty or whatever it was, but this feeling of worth being worthy to receive it's gotta be in there. There's gotta be a reason why we can attract it in one area and not in another. Cause you got more hangups in one area than another. It yeah. really is just, you've just got more negative beliefs. So I think it's about every, you know, getting clear on what the specifics of those beliefs are. And we were talking about this with the therapy thing, like maybe your eight year old self believes yada, yada, yada. Right. So So it really is looking at this area of your life. And this is what's so beautiful again, is like, you're aware that you're kicking ass in the money in the, in the, in the career, the kids, la la, but you know, that this area, you don't feel like you can receive what specific things don't you feel like you can receive? What is that specific thing? And then what's the belief around that specific thing? What's the feeling around that specific thing? You know, and really take the time to be in it and to look at it and to disempower it. And I hear so many of my friends say things like, well, I don't need it. I don't need anything from him. You know, at this point it's, it's, he's irrelevant. He doesn't have to work. He doesn't have to do anything. We have help with the kid, you know, and what happens is I heard Gabby Bernstein say, she said to me the other day, that's just you lowering your desire. Cause again, you don't feel mm-hmm. like it's going to be answered. Right. And I get these notes from women in my audience all the time. I'm starting to feel like I'm growing at work, but I guess you can't have both. I guess you can right, have a really right, powerful right. career. Especially not as women, men can. <laughs> yeah, nobody says to a man, who's watching your kids like I when know. you're working. But to yes. me, they're always like, how do you balance that? Yeah, you I know. Do. I know. It's okay. We're growing out of it. I'm really excited that we get to be the ones. (laughs) I am. I really am. What an honor. Right. I mean, and look at the people you surround yourself. Like I know so many kick-ass women who are doing incredible things. It's such an exciting time. It is such an exciting time. And yesterday I was talking to Alison Bird and she was saying like, we actually are more relatable when we step into our power. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? What does it mean to fully step into our power? And how do you think that makes us more relatable? Because all women deep down know they've got it or else we wouldn't be talking about this. Yeah. Right. If you were convinced that you didn't deserve more, that you shouldn't receive more, that you were okay. If that really was true for you, nobody out there who's listening to this would be listening to this. We know it. And so when we see somebody doing it, we can relate to her because we know we've got it inside of ourselves. We just haven't been able to really access it or let it blossom, but it's there. That's the gift that you've given to the millions and millions of people that bought your book because you, you. by the end of chapter one, you're just like, Oh, you know what? I'm, not just ready. I'm over ready for this. Mm -hmm. Let's go. Yeah. And you guys, and I really like the thing that I'm so obsessed with is time is finite. You know, we don't have endless amounts of time. So getting, we don't need to wait until we're living in a garage. (laughs) We don't need to wait till we're 50 to get good at boundaries. Like we can do it now. And then the sooner you, 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 figure it out and you let yourself take bigger and bigger steps and the longer you get to live in that new reality. And that's pretty exciting. You said before, like fear and exhilaration are kind of, they go together. Mm, yeah. And I feel like people listen to you or read your books and they, they feel so inspired and then taking the actual steps, mm-hmm. the fear is just so great. It's so great. So how do we dance with that? If we want to be a badass and we want to change our habits and we want to do it and we get it, we logically get it. We totally read the book. We underlined all the right things and we are really (laughs) afraid. What the hell is that fear? And how can we just decide we're driving a freight train through it? We're going to do it anyway. The fear is the fear of abandonment. Like when you really break it down, you change who you're being 
by doing something different, which changes your identity, which puts you at risk of losing, you know, this is a question that comes up every single time I do a talk. What do you do when the people closest to you don't support your hopes and dreams, right? The reason it comes up all the time is when you go for it and you decide you're going to be a badass and you're going to shift some big thing, the people around you are losing you the way they know you. You're changing your identity. You're basically killing off their buddy or their wife or their right. whatever. Right. So then they're like, well, you know, nine out of 10 restaurants fail, or you've tried that before and it didn't work, or, you know, they make fun of you or whatever. Um, that's where that comes from. So it's risky. And that's, that is, I believe most, most of our fears can be boiled down to a fear of abandonment. Um, but you abandon yourself if you don't go for it and if you don't blossom. And by staying small, just to make sure everybody around you isn't upset causes resentment and disease. I mean, you're gonna you're gonna hold dis-ease in your body because you're not letting yourself out of your cage, right? So I like to sort of flip that fear on its head and be like, I'm more scared of living a life full of suckery and smallness than I am of whatever it is I have to do, right? So another thing is the way- Suckery you know, and smallness. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, I fear is the best compass that you're on the right track, right? I always talk about if you want to change your life and you're not, not scared, you're doing something wrong. So welcome that fear, man, because that means you're on the right track. And, you know, often I do podcasts and people are like, what is the one thing you can leave my audience with today that will change our lives? And I'm, oh, I always say, do something every day that scares the crap out of you. If you did something every day, I'd with intimacy, with career, with money, with what, with your physical, like pushing yourself. If you did something every single day, your life would change so fast. You yeah. will not know what hit you. Yeah. So, I don't know if you've ever read it. You probably have, but I just read Janine Roth's book, women, food, and God. Mm -mm. Oh my God, Jen, it's so good. Really? But she yeah. says in this book that you're always running from this feeling. You don't want to feel, let's say it's a feeling of abandonment. But when you actually feel this feeling that you're so afraid of that instead you'll s eat all the donuts or work, work yourself to the bone or whatever you're doing to escape, she says, you finally feel the feeling, you realize there's something beyond that feeling that's holding that feeling. And all of a sudden you have this feeling of like, oh, it didn't annihilate me to feel this right. feeling. Right. That was like mind yeah. blowing. And then you feel this thing, which is better than any escape, which is just a feeling of being integrated yeah. where you're just there with it and yeah. it's like ooh, this is intense and i can turn toward it and it's not destroying me and now there's some equanimity that feels almost better than any escape could ever do right and that is that's the dark night of the soul and what people need to realize about someone like you is that you had to be willing to do that in order to come out of that tunnel on the other side. You know, what's that great saying? Ask, grass or cash. No one rides for free. Like nobody rides. You got to pay the price. Like there's no growth without friction in nature right like what's that there's a seed that needs to be like caught on fire so that it can burst open and something can grow out of it birth let's look at birth ladies that hurts right <laughs> like that's the best metaphor there is so it's gonna be challenging you know and it's 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 just sort of when you're in that moment of not knowing and the pain and the terror and the doubt and all that stuff just breathing and staying with it and understanding that without that, you don't get to the other side. You know, it's, it's, it's hard, you know, when you're in it to, to keep your eye on the ball, but I haven't had this, I don't, I personally haven't, and none of my clients that I coached ever had a massive breakthrough success without utter chaos or, you know, roadblocks or just being taken down. And it's good, it makes you strong. Speaking of that feeling, I sometimes see, okay. especially before COVID, I sometimes would see that you were about to speak on stage in front of like thousands of people. And I'm like, 
How do you literally do that? Like where your stomach doesn't drop, like you feel like you're on that part of the roller coaster where like you have to hold. How do you meet yourself in that moment and then walk out on stage? Um, okay, well, first of all, usually it's in front of fans. So it's a love fest. Like when I get to go on my book tours and I'm in a room full of people who own my books, it is like the best slumber party on earth. Like it is, so that's really easy. That actually, I don't even get nervous. I'm just like, let me at them. (laughs) However, uh, I did do, I was, uh, yeah, I I was, uh, uh, it was the Tony Robbins. That's what I I saw that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That I was terrified of. And because none of those people knew who the hell I was. And um, it seems you know, so it major. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, um, so I was terrified. And but I got some really great advice from a coach once who said, when you are about to go on stage and you're nervous, it's because you're making it about yourself and you want to be liked. And so the, the fear is coming from bombing, right? Of people not liking you. And she's like, when you make it about being of service, and being up there to, to say mm-hmm. whatever these people need to hear and give them something, then you don't get quite so nervous. And that, that really is true. And I will say just, you know, in general, I'm, I, I so thought I was going to love speaking, but it is, I'm an introvert actually. And it's, it depletes the hell out of me. Not my, my book readings are very energizing, but, but that kind of stuff, I don't even like it that much. So that's Interesting. Yeah. I'm not surprised because you, you live sort of a spiritual life. You're not living mm-hmm. in LA, you know, you chose to live mm-hmm. in a sort of a smaller town. And I wanted to just ask you as we're like, sort of just finishing up when you just said that thing about how you go out there and think about just being in service. Mm-hmm. If you had to boil it all down to one message, what do you think is the one thing that people really need to hear from you? most? Like, what do you feel like they need you to say? Oh boy. I already use my go do something scary card (laughs) every day. I think it is, um, you know, it changes. And, And the space that I'm in now is just see what you can get away with. Like I love make that. it fun, bring the fun back in. It really you know, life is so precious and there's, there's, there's no need to make it heavier than, than it needs to be. Just see, just see if you can bring the adventure back in. I love that. And it's so you, I think it's the Uh reason why your books do so incredibly well. I mean, when I say so incredibly well, there is not even a second. It's like, there's Jen's books and then there's Mm. all the other books that sort of, (laughs) no, serious. It's really how it is. And I think it's because of that. I think that there's an approach you take where it's like, let this be easy. Let's make this silly. Let's not make this so freaking heavy. Mm. Books are fun to read. They're like, it's like a truth bomb. And then the, your best friend hanging out with you, having a margarita on the beach at the same time, but telling you what you actually need to hear, not just what you want to hear. And, uh, I love it. See what you can get away with. Right. Not making it so serious. Right. Yeah. And I'm, I'm saying that for myself. Like I, that is something I just remembered as like, Oh, right. Yes. Could we please drop the drama and let's just go for it. So this is my last question. Then let me Mm -hmm. ask you this. You've done, you've done a lot of things that are on Mm -hmm. people's bucket lists. So what the hell else could you possibly want to see if you could get away with, what would it be for you? Okay. So I wouldn't, I I don't like to talk about things before I've done them because I get a certain amount of satisfaction then I don't do them. It's almost like talking about it. Now I've done it. (laughs) <laughs> um, but, uh, I might, okay. I'm writing, I'm writing a script and I might star in it if I can. And I have never acted before. I'm not really an actress, but I was like, why not? Like, I'm just going to see if I can come and I'm going to go big. I'm like trying to become like a movie star. <laughs> Jen. Cause it'd be fun. And, and I was talking to a friend of mine this morning about it. I was like, the great thing about this, I haven't been in this space in a long time where I've done something. I have no freaking idea what I'm doing. And it's like, at this level, I beat them to the punch. Like, you can't tell me I'm a shitty actress because I already know I, like, I don't know what I'm doing. So I, I don't care. I called it first. Like, and it gives so much freedom. It's so much fun. This is the coolest freaking thing. And <laughs> James Clear, who I know might be a nemesis at this point because he wrote a book on habits. Oh, he great. says in his book, that one of the best ways to make things happen is to start talking about your dreams. 
Yeah. All right, Jen. So tell <laughs> us where we can get your latest book and all the others and where we can possibly use, you said it a few times that you do some coaching. I imagine it's like a group course or some <sighs> program. How can we coach with you? How can we read your books? I'm not doing any live coaching right now, but I may down the road. So if you want to sign up for my mailing list and be notified of that or follow me on Instagram. So all my, all my social media is Jen Sincero. My website is also jensincero.com. You can also get there through youareabadass.com. Um, and yeah, those are the things I have. I have online co um, coaching programs that are old courses I taught, but um, I might roll something out in the future. That's See what you can get away with. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah good idea. <laughs> Thank you so much for today. This was so much fun. Oh, this was a delight. I love talking to you. So fun.